Hello, welcome to lecture 6 of this course. This is lecture number 3 of module 2. In this lecture, I am going to discuss about the so-called EPR paradox, Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen paradox and also I will discuss about Bell's inequalities. Hopefully, this lecture would give you an idea how the concept of entanglement came into existence and also some philosophical aspect associated with it. Perhaps in lecture 1 of this course, I told you that uh, Einstein never felt comfortable with the theory of quantum mechanics. He did not say that quantum mechanics is wrong, but he said that the, it, this theory of quantum mechanics is incomplete. In order to prove his point, in collaboration with Podolsky and Rosen, he wrote a research article in 1935 giving birth to the so-called EPR paradox. I am going to give you a very simple version of their argument that they provided in their article. However, before I discuss the EPR arguments, let me discuss about a unique feature of quantum mechanics that is its non-local character. Let us consider two photons, consider two photons in an entangled state in an entangled state given by this configuration let us say they are they form a singlet state and they are expressed by this configuration k h a k h b minus k v a k v b let me denote it as equation number one here here this kate h a refers to a single photon in the horizontal polarization mode in the horizontal polarization mode and having the spatial mode a having the spatial mode a that means it is at the location a on the other hand hb kate hb refers to a single photon a single photon in the horizontal in the horizontal polarization mode polarization mode and it has the spatial mode b that means it is at the location say b similarly v a refers to the vertical polarization mode vertical polarization mode and spatial mode here is a spatial mode a for the single photon and similar way vb refers to vertical polarization mode okay and spatial mode here is b that means it is at the location b diagrammatically speaking what i mean to say is this suppose say the first photon is at the location a or it has a spatial mode a and the other photon has spatial mode b and this first photon is horizontally polarized if it is horizontally polarized the other one is also horizontally polarized or if the first photon that is photon at position a position a is vertically polarized the other one is also other photon 
which is located at position B is also vertically polarized and in this case this particular photon which is vertically polarized at the location B is represented by kth VB this photon at A which is vertically polarized it represented by kth VA this photon this particular photon which is horizontally polarized at location A is represented by ket H A and this photon at location B which is horizontally polarized it represented by ket H P. So this is basically the scenario we are having. Now overall the entangled state means that the photons are in a superposition of either both being horizontally polarized or both being vertically polarized. Now you have to note that it is not possible to write down a cage state that describes the polarization state of just one of the photons. The cage must describe both photons jointly and hence this term entanglement is used here. Now suppose the photons are initially at the location say A and B, B nearby and I take them away to a far away location. Suppose one photon is at here, the other photon is at B and this is at a very far away distance. Then uh, if you do this carefully, then equation one that I have written will continue to describe this state but now we have a system described by a singlet gate whose individual parts may be space like separated. If a measurement is made on one of the photons and it is found to be say horizontally polarized, the other one, the state of the other photon immediately becomes horizontal. It appears that actions on one photon immediately affects its entangled partner seemingly in contradiction with special relativity and special relativity as you know requires that any communication is uh, limited by the speed of light that means no communication can travel faster than the speed of light because of this behavior of entangled systems quantum mechanics is often referred to as a non-local theory now the orthodox view of quantum mechanics says that there is no contradiction at all and we are going to discuss this issue little bit later. Now let us discuss EPR's thought experiment. The original EPR thought experiment used position and momentum as variables. And you know that position and momentum are continuous variables. Consider two particles A and B originating from the same source. Consider two particles A and B originating from the same source okay and they travel in the opposite direction suppose this is the source this is the source and particle a travels in this direction this is particle a and the particle b travels in the opposite direction and they travel in such a way that their position are always correlated. Position of A and B are correlated. What I mean by this is as follows. In the position basis, in the position basis, it's a continuous basis in the position basis the state of the particles can be represented by because i am discussing epr paradox say eh? the state is represented by a ket called epr and the state is going to be written like this here x ket x a ket x a refers to position eigen ket this is position eigen kate or eigen state of particle A, particle A, while x kate x b is the position eigen state or eigen kate. 
it's a position eigen state of particle b so this correlation effectively means that if i measure position of particle a and i find it at x a then immediately the position of the particle b will also be known and it would be at x b and this is an important equation let me denote it say equation number one by the way some of you may have seen position basis which is a continuous variable basis for the first time so for them let me digress a little bit and discuss very briefly about quantum mechanics of continuous variable and i'm going to discuss very briefly about position basis as well as momentum basis which is going to be very relevant for our discussion in general the quantum mechanics principles particularly postulate etc we discuss are in the context of discrete variables for example when we write k psi is equal to summation n is equal to 1 to infinity cn phi n here phi n are the eigen case cn are the complex coefficient the use of the summation sign indicates that we are dealing with discrete variables in the sense that here n takes value 1 2 3 and so on it is discrete the observables we consider in discrete variable quantum mechanics exhibit discrete eigenvalue spectra for example if i talk about an observable say spin of an electron it can take the value either plus s cross by 2 or minus s cross by 2 as you know plus s cross by 2 corresponds to the eigen state spin up state and minus s cross by correspond to the spin down state but if we go over to continuous variable quantum mechanics there the observables have continuous eigen spectra for example say position of a particle if i talk about position of a particle let us say one dimension uh, if i talk in in one dimension the position x takes value from minus infinity to plus infinity so it has continuous eigen spectra now to discuss quantum mechanics with continuous variable let me remind you about eigenvalue equation for discrete variable case for a, namely say when we have this eigenvalue equation a applied on the uh, eigen case say a is going to give me a a and a is the eigenvalue here this is eigenvalue and this is my eigen gate and we can extend this analogy to the continuous variable case in analogy to this eigenvalue equation i can write an eigenvalue equation for continuous variable also as follows xi operating on the eigen gate xi dash is going to give me xi dash xi dash is an eigenvalue and i will get xi dash this is the eigen kit so here this xi is the operator it's the operator xi dash is the eigen kit and xi dash is here eigen value so this i am talking in terms of continuous variable this analogy we can extend to a number of cases for example the so called orthonormality condition orthonormality condition that we encounter in discrete variable quantum mechanics is as follows it says the scalar product of this eigenbasis phi m phi n is equal to delta m n where delta m n is the Dirac delta function this means that the state phi m and phi n are orthonormal in anal this we can extend to continuous variable as follows we will write in continuous variable the scalar product of say xi dash and xi double dash would be equal to now instead of this dirac delta here here we are having dirac delta in continuous variable case we are going to write a kronecker delta that would be delta xi dash minus xi double dash 
that means if xi dash is equal to xi double dash then this is going to give me one if xi dash is not equal to xi double dash this is going to give me zero so this is kronecker delta the same thing we can do for the completeness condition as well so let me write the very important completeness condition in discrete variable we write the completeness condition as follows we write summation say a dash a dash a dash is equal to identity operator it is identity we can extend this to continuous variable summation is now going to be replaced by a integral and we'll have d xi dash k xi dash bra xi dash would be equal to one okay now any arbitrary uh, state k alpha we can write in discrete variables using this completeness condition as follows we can write a dash a dash a dash alpha the same thing we can do in continuous variable case also k alpha is equal to integration d xi dash xi dash xi dash alpha all right now what about the uh, scalar product of two uh, quantities two kets say b k beta and k alpha in discrete variable we write it as this say summation a dash beta and we are going to just use the completeness condition we are going to sandwich this thing inside and then this is what we will get and the analogy for continuous variable is again simple and this would be simply replaced by this integration d xi dash beta xi dash xi dash alpha okay as you can see uh, going from discrete variable to continuous variable appears to be very straightforward now we'll discuss about the position and momentum basis which is extremely useful in continuous variable quantum mechanics so let us discuss about position basis first then we'll go to momentum basis say the position operator x satisfy the eigenvalue equation x x dash is equal to x dash x dash where x dash is the eigenvalue position eigenvalue this is eigenvalue and k x dash is the eigen k and x is the operator i am not using the cap sign here uh, i am avoiding it but you should understand that i am talking about operator here now this eigen k x k x dash form a complete set called the position and they are called position basis and satisfy the orthonormality condition the orthonormality condition is scalar product of x x dash is equal to kronecker delta x minus x dash here this x corresponds to the eigen value corresponding to the eigen state uh, kt x and x dash is the eigen value corresponding to the eigen state x dash okay and also the completeness condition satisfied by this position eigen kts are as follows dx kt x bra x is equal to 1 and we can expand any arbitrary k in the position basis for example suppose we have this eigen k psi of t k psi of t i can use position basis basically i have to use the completeness condition then i have to i can write then i can write it as follows so simply this is what i will have right now here this quantity you see this is a scalar quantity and it's just a number and it is generally denoted by we can denote this quantity as psi xt now you may recognize that this is a complex number 
and this is called the probability amplitude this is the probability amplitude and also known as the wave function effectively it means that when the system is in the state psi of t it is in a position eigen k level by x the quantity psi of xt is termed as the wave function in quantum mechanics as i have said and it's basically a state vector in the position basis it is also called position space wave function now let me discuss about momentum basis so momentum basis is actually straightforward it it is exactly similar to what we have for position basis in the momentum basis we can again write a eigen value equation of this type say p k p dash is equal to p dash k p where p is the momentum k p dash is the momentum eigen k this is the eigen k and p dash is the eigen value and p is the operator this is the operator and it also has the similar kind of properties for example the orthonormality condition would be p p dash would be equal to delta p minus p dash and the completeness condition would be dp k p bra p is equal to identity operator and here also i can write an arbitrary state psi of t in terms of momentum basis as follows i can write simply i have to use this completeness condition and i will write uh, ket p bra p psi of t as you see this guy is again a complex number it's a complex number and this has also a name and in short notation we can write p psi of t is equal to psi tilde of pt and this is the so called momentum space wave function corresponding to the state vector psi of t uh, now there is a connection between the two bases position basis and the momentum basis to uh, so the connection let me write again psi of pt that's the momentum space wave function is equal to p psi of t now let me apply the completeness condition from in the position basis and let me send do is this here dx x x which is the identity and i will have psi of t and this is identity i can always put it uh, sandwich it between two scalar products using this i can express psi tilde of pt the momentum space wave function is equal to as you can see this guy here you see this guy here is nothing but psi of xt so utilizing that i can write integration dx uh, px scalar product of px this is it's a number psi of xt okay so this is the connection between the uh, position space wave function psi xt and the momentum space wave function psi tilde pt and we have to work out this quantity it can be worked out i think i will do that in the problem solving session number 2 it it it, it can be shown that this scalar product of p and x is equal to e to the power i by h cross p x then we have psi tilde of p t is equal to integration d x e to the power i by h cross p x psi of x t in the similar way we can show that this quantity x p is equal to e to the power minus i by h cross px so as you may recognize that from this expression 
psi of xt is the inverse fourier transformation of psi tilde of pt or psi tilde of pt is the fourier transform of the uh, position wave function uh, psi of xt let us now come back to this equation number 1 now in the momentum basis we can write this epr state as follows gate epr is equal to so we have dx x a x b and if i use say the completeness condition in the momentum basis let me write dp pa pa right this is a identity then i have here xa and for the other let me send this uh, another uh, completeness condition in momentum basis here let us say it is dp dash p dash b p dash b and i have here xp i think it is easy to uh, follow if you look at it carefully you will be able to follow it easily and this i can now write as dp pa dp dash p dash b and integration because this quantity and this quantity i know this quantity is e to the power i by h cross px and this quantity here is e to the power i by h cross p dash x so therefore i can write here integration e to the power i by h cross p plus p dash x dx and this guy is nothing but the dirac delta function delta p plus p dash so therefore i can write let me write it cleanly dp pa dp dash p dash b delta p plus p dash now applying the properties of the dirac delta function i can write dp pa minus pb so epr state in the momentum basis i get it as this one here this k pa this is the momentum eigen state momentum eigen state of particle a now from this equation let's say this equation number 2 this is the epr state in the momentum basis from here you can see that the momentum is exactly anti correlated for this state if a measurement of particle a is made if momentum measurement is done and if we find that the momentum of particle a is p then immediately the momentum of the particle p uh, particle b would be minus p it would be opposite to that of particle a and epr are good that this situation violated the spirit of the heisenberg uncertainty relation because what to what was the argument is that that measurement is done on the particle a only and the particle b is separated from a in a space like way that means it is uh, separated from a by far away distance so measurement that is done on particle a by an observer at a is not going to affect anything on the particle b right so it was according to them it was very 
it's a kind of very bizarre situation here that without making any kind of measurement on b we can know the or the observer at a can know the position and or the momentum of b with arbitrary precision and because the choice of the measurement was arbitrary and apparently it did not affect the real situation of the other particle it seemed that the particle b must have some well defined value of this observable in the very first place contrary to contrary to heisenberg uncertainty relation and the quantum description implies that a connection between the particles even when far apart which einstein termed as spooky action at a distance so epier's conclusion was that quantum mechanics is incomplete and there must be some additional hidden variables determining the real situation of each particle now there is another version of epier which was uh, put forward by uh, british physicist david bohm involving discrete variables now let me give you a simplified version of bohm's epier version of thought experiment consider the decay consider the decay of a neutral that means a chargeless particle a neutral and also spinless that means spin zero a spinless particle into suppose it is decaying into an electron let me say electron a and a positron and a positron let's say b okay that means if you have a neutral particle say m and its charge is zero it is decaying into an electron electron is going this way suppose this is electron a its charge is e minus uh, and the positron is b its charge is e plus now because the uh, it has started with a zero spin Uh, the source uh, has spin zero the total angular momentum spin angular momentum has to be conserved so this a and b this electron and the positron are described by a singlet configuration say this one given by this configuration 1 by root 2 if the electron is found to be in the up state the positron has to be in the down state so that the uh, spin angular momentum is conserved or if the electron is found in the down state the positron has to be in the up spin state now quantum mechanics is completely clueless which combination you will get however it does say that the measurement will be correlated so it does say that the measurement will be correlated it would be correlated now you will uh, get each combination half the time on the average that means either you will get uh, electron to be in the up state positron to be in the down state or the electron in the down state and the positron in the up state you are going to that A half of the time on the average if several measurements are carried out the apparent trouble is that uh, if we know that a is in spin up state right if a is in spin up state then b is in the spin down state and for sure however a and b may be separated separated from each other even say by 100 light years now epier considered this as spooky action at a distance in fact in essence there are two views uh, about this par uh, paradox one is the realist view realist uh, says that there is nothing surprising the electron really had spin up and the positron spin down from the moment they were created it is just that quantum mechanics did not know about it on the other hand the quantum mechanical view which is the orthodox view is that 
neither particle had either spin up or spin down until the act of measurement is intervened. Our measurement of the electron A collapsed the wave function and immediately produced the spin of the positron B even if they are at 100 light years away or whatever distance they are away. The fundamental assumption on which EPR's argument rests is that no influence can travel greater than the speed of light. This is the principle of locality. EPR paradox was considered quite philosophical uh, till quite some time uh, because no experiment could be designed to test EPR's thought experiment. However, in 1964, John Stuart Bell came up with an excellent research article and there he gave a theoretical basis by which experiment could be designed and quantum mechanics could be tested. John Bell came up with a theorem which is now called Bell's theorem. It consists of a proof that shows that the predictions of quantum mechanics differ from the predictions of the so-called local hidden variable theory. And he came up with what is now very popularly known as Bell's inequalities. We are going to discuss about Bell's inequalities, a simplified version of that now. Let us go back to Bohm's EPR experiment. In that experiment, we had a neutral particle, say M0, and this particle decays into two other particle, one particle being the electron, say A, and it had charge E minus, and the other one is a positron going in the opposite direction, denoted by B, and it has charge E plus. In the experiment, the orientation of the detector detecting the electron and positron spin were parallel to each other as shown in this figure here and they are in the same direction. Now if say the detector at A resistors, resistors spin as up that is say plus 1 in the unit of h cross by 2 in the unit of plus h cross by 2 so rather than writing plus h cross by 2 i am writing plus 1 so it is in the unit of h cross by 2 if a resistor spin is up b resistors as we have already discussed earlier spin as down that is minus 1 and the product is always of these two results the product is always minus one bill suggested a generalization of the above experiment and he allowed that the detector exists exists to rotate independently as I said that in this uh, Bohm's experiment, the detector axes are parallel to each other. But Bell suggested that, okay, let's say the detector axis can rotate. Suppose this is the detector axis at A. It is along the direction, say, A. Not necessarily that the detector at B has it axis along A rather say it may be along some other direction say directed along B. Okay. And this particle again it's getting decayed into two particles A and B. But the detector orientation may not be parallel to each other. Here at A you are having electron and here at B you are having positron. If A is equal to B, that means the detector axes are parallel, you recover the original EPR experiments of David Bohm. Bell proposed to calculate average value of the product of the spins for two given set of orientations. So what he says that the product of these two measurements, if both the axes are parallel to each other, at detector A and B, you are going to get the product as minus 1. So here P refers to average value of the product. So 
this refers to average value of the product by product i means the result that you obtain at detector a and b as regards the orientation of the spin okay now on the other hand if say b is minus a that means the detector axis at b is uh, anti parallel to a then obviously the product of these two measurements you are going to get is to be plus one right from this we can write for arbitrary orientation as per quantum mechanics this results that i am discussing is using quantum mechanics so as per quantum mechanics so as per quantum mechanics we have this result general result that product of the two measurements at the detector a and at detector b is going to be minus a dot b so this is quantum mechanical result this relation this particular relation we are going to uh, proof in the problem solving session by giving a proper example of two spin half particles now what the so called local hidden variable theory says about this average or expectation value let us find out we are going to make some assumption first assumptions first say the complete set of the complete set of electron positron system electron positron system which is a plus b system is characterized by is characterized by hidden variable hidden variable lambda we don't know what is this hidden variable and we have no control over it also assume that the outcome of electron measurement electron measurement is independent independent of the orientation of the detector at b detector b so orientation means we don't know whatever be the uh, direction of b uh, the outcome of electron measurement is not going to depend on that suppose there exists some function say a a function of the orientation axis of the detector at a and hidden variable lambda and this function gives the result of gives the result of electron measurement electron spin measurement spin measurement and we also have a function b which is a function of the detector orientation at b and hidden variable lambda and this gives the result of positron spin measurement result of positron spin measurement okay now this function can take only values plus 1 or n minus 1 so a this function a a lambda it takes value either plus 1 or minus 1 and b takes value because the spin can be either plus half or minus half that's why both a and k can take value uh, plus 1 or minus 1 let me say this is an important uh, proposition so let me say this is equation number 1 now when the detectors are aligned suppose the detectors are aligned that means the orientation of the detector at a and b are parallel when the detectors are aligned then we will get 
a of a lambda is equal to minus b of a lambda because as you know if the detector a detects that the spin is plus one then obviously the detector b should give the opposite result of a and that is going to happen for all hidden variable lambda and this is our proposition number two now the average product of measurement or expectation value average expectation value or the average product of the measurement product of the measurement is it is given by p a b is equal to rho lambda i will explain what it is product is a a lambda b b lambda d lambda where rho lambda is the probability density of hidden variable this is probability density of hidden variable hidden variable and just like any probability distribution it should satisfy this condition rho lambda d lambda should be equal to one because it has to take some hidden variable out of all the distribution and now using this equation say this is my equation number three using equation two equation two in equation three i can rewrite equation three as follows i can rewrite equation three as this p a b is equal to minus rho lambda a a lambda a b lambda okay d lambda so here i have used this equation number two in equation number three and that's how i get this equation so let me name it as equation number four now if i take an another orientation of the detector it may be at detector a or at c uh, at b say if c is any other orientation or any other unit vector or orientation of a detector then i can write because now i have this equation number four i have using this equation i can write p a b minus p a c i just have to use equation four and then i will get very easily this expression rho lambda a a lambda b now i am replacing b by a so i will have a b lambda minus a a lambda a c lambda d lambda okay let me say this is my equation number five now because because of the fact that a b lambda whole square is equal to one because a b lambda can take value either plus one or minus one so utilizing this now i can rewrite further this equation number five so i uh, urge you to actually if you take pen and paper along with me you will be able to follow the steps very easily so this equation number five now i can write as this uh, this one i will write minus rho lambda let me write down all the steps carefully a lambda a b lambda minus a a lambda and in between this let me sandwich this guy this expression let me sandwich that is a because this is equal to one b lambda uh, whole square then i have a c lambda d lambda 
okay so using this it is straightforward to see that i can write this equation as this rho lambda i will take a a lambda a b lambda common i will take it out i will have one minus a b lambda a c lambda i will have a i am taking it common now a a lambda a b lambda d lambda i hope all of you can follow it now we are going to use the fact that this product a a lambda a b lambda it can take value either one or minus one or plus one so it basically lies between minus one and plus one right it can maximum it can take plus one and minimum it can take minus one so it lies between then uh, between these two values and moreover the fact is that rho lambda one minus a b lambda a c lambda this is also going to be greater than or equal to zero because rho lambda is has to be a positive quantity it is probability so this quantity has to be greater than or equal to zero so utilizing these two properties to uh, information i can therefore write p a b minus p a c is equal to if i take the modulus then i am going to get this inequality very in a straightforward way that this would be less than or equal to rho lambda 1 minus a b lambda a c lambda d lambda now you see that this guy this quantity is nothing but with this minus sign this quantity is nothing but p b c right so uh, along with of course uh, rho lambda if you see the definition of let me again remind you this expression if you see so using that definition along with this integral this integral is also there so this expression let me say this is my equation number six i think i have written this is equation number five so this equation number six i can write in a compact form as follows that is p a b minus p a c is less than or equal to 1 plus p b c and this is the very famous bell's inequality this is the so-called bell's inequality it is one of the form there are many many form, forms in literature many other forms are there but primarily this is one of the most popular form of bell's inequality and this holds for any local hidden variable theory now the question is does the quantum mechanics predictions compatible with bell's inequality or not to do that let us say all three vectors say all three vectors a or, or detector orientation a b c lie in a plane okay lie in a plane and say c makes an angle say the orientation c makes an angle 45 degree angle of 45 degree with both uh, we can always uh, have this kind of situation in experiment with both a and b that means the a and b are orthogonal to each other the detector positions of detector a and detector b are perpendicular to each other and c is making an angle of 45 degree with both of them so this is 45 degree this is 45 degree therefore quantum mechanics what quantum mechanics says if this is the orientation as per quantum mechanics 
we know the result p a b is equal to minus a dot b which is equal to zero a and b are by the way unit vectors so because the angle is 90 degree uh, uh, between them so cos 90 zero so p a b is equal to zero on the other hand p a c is uh, it is cos 45 degree with a minus sign right with minus a dot c so therefore it is minus one by root two and p we are left with another quantity that is p b c p b c is also minus b dot c and because the angle is 45 degree this is one by root two and one by root two is approximately 0 0.707 okay this is minus 0 0.707 now let us see whether bell's inequality if we put whether that inequality is uh, uh, satisfied by this quantum mechanical results if i put this here this is my bell inequality 1 plus p b c now p a b is equal to 0 and this equal to uh, this quantity 1 by root 2 so therefore if i am taking the modulus so this would be 0 0.707 and this should be less than or equal to 1 and p b c is minus 1 by root 2 so it is 1 minus approximately 0 0.707 so this is equal to uh, 0 0.293 now it is very clear that 0 0.707 is definitely greater than 0 0.293 so therefore this bell's inequality is not obeyed by quantum mechanics results so quantum mechanics is not consistent with bell's inequality and uh, therefore uh, we can discard the so-called local hidden variable theory one important alternative form of Bell's inequality is the so-called CHSH inequality. It is similar to Bell's inequality that we have discussed and it can be worked out using the form that we have discussed. And this inequality is named under four physicists. They are uh, C stands for closer h stands for horn s stands for simony simony and the other h, h stands for halt so this is a very relevant uh, inequality in terms of experiments are concerned and the form of this inequality uh, is as follows it is the modulus of p a b a b are the as i said the detector orientation p a c this is less than or equal to 2 plus minus p a dash c this is another orientation of the detector at say a and this is another is p a dash b okay and or we can write in a more convenient form this inequality is also written as minus 2 less than or equal to s lambda a a dash b c it is less than or equal to plus 2 where this quantity s which is a function of lambda and the orientations a a dash b c is equal to p a b minus p a c plus p a dash b plus p a this c the proof of this inequality is straightforward and we will do that in problem solving session 2 by the way 
The Bell's inequality that I have proved earlier is inspired by Griffith's quantum mechanics book, chapter 12. Now, in as regards this CHSA's inequality is concerned, Closer and his group experimentally demonstrated that quantum mechanics violate this inequality, thereby discarding, discarding local hidden variable theory. Let me stop for now. With this lecture, we have completed the second module of the course. I encourage you to go through the problem solving session number two. In the next lecture, we will start discussing quantification of quantum entanglement. So see you in the next lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you.